Travis Eldridge. I am Tom Eshin. We have a full slate of men's and women's games this weekend, and what an awesome thing to be able to say. It feels like we're officially back now, because yeah. last weekend, last couple of weeks, we had some men's games. It was good, but this is the first full slate. We're back, uh, and because of that, we have a huge show. We got Joey Epstein from Hopkins joining us. They've got a huge weekend with two games this weekend. We'll talk about that. Plus, We've got uh, Lehigh head coach Kevin Cassis, so a couple of great interviews. Yeah, later on in the program, we'll tell you the game we're watching this weekend. We're going to break down, go through 10 women's games, and uh, t give us your quick picks there. And, and we'll start with the men's side of things and yeah. some of the three biggest topics, I guess, some storyline, yes. superlative type deal. Uh, new segment as we continue to preview the, these, these weekend games here. Yeah, we got to look ahead to what this weekend is. So we're going to start... Um, with the most important first impression, which team is it most important that gets off to a good start here? Who are you looking at? I'm going with Loyola. Okay. They go to Maryland at noon on Saturday. Loyola is the eighth-ranked team in the country, maybe a little bit quietly. I know we had our Patriot League preview uh, about a month or so ago now, and I'm pretty high on Loyola and everything they have coming back and a lot of experience there with Olmstead and Lindley on the offensive end. Then you got guys like Wires and McNulty defensively going up against the really good Maryland team, as we saw in their debut and that big victory, and Logan was Nauskas, who played really well wearing that number one. I think that's sort of the, the common theme we're going to see here this year with Maryland being able to score a lot of goals. Keegan Khan had four goals in that game over that win over High Point as well. Going up against Loyola in a top 10 defense from last year, I just think for Loyola it's important for them to get off to a good start here. Yep. I think maybe they're a top 10 team, and you have to act like that, right? You have, you have to act like the eight, eighth ranked team in the country. You can't go into Maryland and get blown out no. by any stretch of the imagination. So they have to keep this one at the very least close, if not go out out there and win and maybe show the rest of the country that they are a player and they are a team that can make it a championship weekend this year. This is not only a huge game for Loyola. This is a huge game for the conference, the yeah. Patriot League, because you look at this Patriot League that has a lot of expectations with Lehigh and Army, both teams that should be in the consideration for the NCAA tournament at the end of the year. Loyola can't go out there and get destroyed at Maryland because that uh, will, whether it's good or not, it will reflect on the entire conference throughout the year. And that will be something that carries through. So Loyola, I think, has to go out there and be close. Uh, you, you mentioned the expectations. I think this has to be a like a rounded 10-goal situation game for Loyola and Maryland. Like, they can't have – I don't think Loyola goes in, and gets 15 in order to win. No, I think yeah. if they're going to win, it's going to be 9, 10, 11 goals. And they defensively hold that Maryland offense – quiet and they keep it a, a little bit slower game yeah I mean they've, they're battle tested this group I mean they lost to Duke in the quarterfinals last year in overtime so that's how close they were to being in championship weekend a year ago that's why yeah. in game one this year they have to say yeah we belonged there last year we belong there this year too I, I look forward to this matchup for that reason but it's important for Loyola to get off to a good start with a pretty intense schedule they go to Hopkins host Duke go to Georgetown all in the first couple weeks of the year so this isn't a big game for them as they begin their season yeah very big uh i'm intrigued by that i'm also intrigued by syracuse and it's for a completely different reason they should win against holy cross that's who they open up with in the carry dome on saturday but in order to, to kind of quiet some of the doubters out there they need to go out there and smoke the crusaders like you got people not voting them in the top 20 <laughs> in the country if you're syracuse if i'm one of those players in that that locker room i'm looking at and going are you kidding me and I'm going out there and showing everybody, despite the fact that Owen Hiltz is beat up, we don't know how long he's going to be out, and we have all these pieces that no one's believing in us. You go out there and you put everything out there and you just say, look, we're taking care of business and we're not fooling around. And that is why this is a huge game for Syracuse, because there are, there are more doubters now maybe than I've remembered in any time in recent memory about a team that has maybe the greatest coaching staff you could have assembled in terms of a, a brand new staff coming in with Gary Gate and Dave Petramala and Pat March and TD Erlin as a faceoff coach. I mean, it, it's surprising to me how much disbelief there is out there about what this program is. For them to be not in the top 20 in the country in some people's polls seems ridiculous to me. I think for Syracuse, this is really important to go out there. For 
first couple of games, take care of business, and remind everybody what this program is. I think you're right about the doubters and all of that, but to me, the first impression is Gary Gate and Dave Patrick. That too. And I want to like the first impression of the Gary Gate era is going to happen here this weekend, and I can't wait to see it and what it looks like on the defensive end for Coach Petro and the impact in such a short time. Maybe they have already made on this program. So for me, the first impression of Gary Gate on the Syracuse sideline for the men's team with Petro and orange and blue next to him. Weird. And we'll get into that with Joey Epstein a little later. But that is going to be a very intriguing first impression on my end. And I think it's the attitude thing, too. Yeah. And I think there's a, both Petro and, and Coach Gate have such different attitudes. I'll be really intrigued to see what the team attitude is about this. But, I mean, I to me, because Coach Gate and Petro, they've had doubters their whole careers at different points in terms of, like, the team they've played on or been a part of or coached or whatever. For these players, I think this is a very unique situation. You don't go to Syracuse and expect to be a team that's not considered one of the top of the country. This is really unique. I'll be interested to see how they come out. Yeah, me too. All right, let's move on. And there's a couple of games which we have some really big-time scores going up yes. against each other. So this is the best duel of the weekend. What is your best duel? So I'm going to go to Sunday, a little pregame for the Super Bowl mm -hmm. at 3 o'clock Eastern time. You've got Asher Nolting and High Point versus Connor Schellenberger mm. and Virginia. Both of these guys shelled out in their first games of the season. Both went off for seven points. You had Asher Nolting, who went for a goal and six assists. You had Schellenberger, who went for two goals and five assists. I am just, like, I think this game has the makings of, like, fireworks. I, Asher Nolting saves his best for these big moments. I think this is a must-watch game on Sunday. Like, skip all the pregame stuff for the Super Bowl. You can... Watch this and then head on over. You still got like an hour and a half to go before the big game. So watch this game. Asher Nolting going to put on a show. I don't know. I'll be interested because Virginia didn't come out of the gates great in that first game in the opener. So I'll be interested to see how they maybe come out differently. And if High Point can make this thing interesting down the stretch, because if they, they do, you give them a shot. It, High Point's got to hang with them for the first three quarters and hope this is a game in the fourth. But I think either way, you're going to get fireworks and highlights coming from Yeah, I mean, we know the high point schedule is always a difficult one. And these are the games in which they've sort of put themselves on the map. And I think Asher Nolting has done the same there yeah. as well. It's been his name in front of this program for a long time now. And this is one of his last goal rounds here. So I think he's going to want to make a big statement. And then you have Schellenberger, who had such an outstanding championship weekend and great freshman season after redshirting his first year, really came to prominence there too. So two guys that I feel like still – have some things that they want to prove to the rest of the country. Yeah, for sure. You know, and Schellenberger trying to back up that great finish to his season and Nolting trying to cement his legacy at the same yeah. time. And they're going up against each other. I love it. Absolutely. Uh, who you got? I have Friday, 5 p.m. in Chapel Hill, Richmond, North Carolina. Mm. Chris Gray and Ryan Lanchbury. Really interesting. I like this. Yeah. You Another know, SoCon ACC matchup. I, I, you're right. That's the theme. A couple <laughs> of fifth-year guys, yeah. number one. So their last go-around. And dealing with some different things. Chris Gray lost his whole midfield last year. Fascinated to see what the Carolina offense is going to look like with some of those changes and how much of that is going to fall on Gray, even more so maybe than in the past. I don't know if they're scoring 17, 18 goals like they did a lot of last year, but watch Gray to try and navigate that and maybe a little bit of a new vibe for North Carolina. I think it's going to be really interesting. And then you have Lanchbury, who has the second most points scored ever in Richmond history and was drafted second into the NLL this past offseason by the Georgia Swarm. A, a guy probably looking to maybe prove to everybody, hey, this is why. You know, I'm, I'm Obviously, that's the box game, but I'm pretty good in the field game too. So a couple of guys that are dealing with some little bit of differences on their offensive end, Richie yeah. Connell, Moving on to Denver for Richmond as well. But at the same time, you got these two guys. They're going to be the focal points of these offenses all year long and get to see them on the same field. It's going to be a treat. I think it's also intriguing, too, because they're guys that I feel like early in their careers kind of similar. Like Chris Gray, obviously, mm -hmm. was incredible at BU. But Lanchbury, a guy who has been a super, like a spectacular scorer at a kind of quote-unquote kind of mid-major type field at Richmond. And so it's... Chris Gray, who transferred to the bigger program and is now the star against Lanchbury, who's still the star at Richmond and has made quite a name for himself nationally there. I, I'm really intrigued yeah. by that matchup. Yeah, me too. Should be fun. Uh, um, okay. Uh, bold prediction for the weekend. What you got? All right. I'm going to Sunday, a 1 o'clock game. Jacksonville at Duke. I think the Dolphins can get it <laughs> wow. done. Wow. Second game of the John weekend Galloway. for Duke. Duke in February, as we know, they're always just trying to, they're not figuring things out, but it's never the finished product for Duke in February, right? 
And it this, wasn't sharp in the that second game no. over the weekend. I mean, the, the weekend. Dolphins come out, they lose to Johns Hopkins 11 to 8, and maybe gave Hopkins a little bit of trouble there. Their attack unit played really well. Max Waldbaum and Jacob Griner combining for seven goals and assist um, in that one. The defense holding Joey Epstein scoreless. So I know Joey Epstein and Brennan O'Neill are different kinds of players, completely different kinds of guys. Yeah. But at the same time, I think maybe John Galloway and bringing in a grad transfer goalie from North Carolina, Luke Millican, 17 saves he against John Hopkins game. at a really big game. And John Galloway and goalies, you know, like he's the he's the goalie whisperer. You know, he knows what he's doing back there. So I think that maybe Jacksonville can pull this off. I really believe that. Duke's second game, they play four games. They're going to be playing four games in a matter of just a couple weeks. Yeah. And Jacksonville looked good enough for me to believe it, right, against Hopkins in their first game. Yeah, no, for sure. I The thing for Jacksonville, which would be important, which was really key for them against Hopkins and made it really interesting, their transition scoring was electric. Yeah. They were going from one end to the other fast, and they were sharp and precise in transition, which I thought for being early in the season was really, really impressive. Yeah. And so if they're going to beat Duke, I think they have to do that again. they yeah. got to be able to get out and go and, and score in the unsettled because Duke's, Duke's defense – in terms of athletically, is really, really strong. So if you can beat him down the field and get a couple of uh, a free ones, that, that's always a plus. Yep. Uh, for me, I'm going to go to the CAA, our bread and butter here. This, this matchup is always awesome in Army and UMass. Mm. And I'm picking the Minutemen to upset Army. I think the Black Knights have a lot of expectations, deservedly so. they got a lot coming back. But so does this UMass team. And I think it's kind of overshadowed by what we've seen from Drexel and Delaware. And obviously, those two teams, kind of the talk of the conference coming into this season. But UMass brings back a ton from teams that have had a lot of success over the last couple of years. You've got Matt Note, who's back in cage. He's been a starter since he was a true freshman in, back in 2020. He was the starter as a freshman when they knocked off Yale in the shortened 2020 season. He only continues to get better, they, and they've got a ton back. I know they lose the All-American and Jeff Trainer, but Dylan Arant, who had a pretty good freshman year, he's back. Gabriel Prosik continues to get better, a Canadian finisher. The Tobin brothers bring some feistiness to this UMass team that you always expect from a Greg Quinella squad. Chris Conley, if he's back healthy, that's an added bonus. And Zach Hockman at the X is really good and can be a difference maker. And I actually think the rules changing – to being standing neutral grip and Hockman's athleticism has been a, been a really good thing for him actually in terms of success. So I think they've got the makings of a of an upset there uh, at Army. This is always an intriguing matchup. Always a great early season game. We didn't get it last year because of the UMass COVID-19 issues. So hopefully we get this one this year and uh, it should be a lot of fun. Well, I think you touched on it with UMass having those COVID issues last year. And all, everybody had to deal with it in different ways. But, you know, UMass seemed to be particularly in impacted, missing about a month, I think it was. Yeah. On their old campus, it, it ran rampant there, unfortunately. So they want to come out here and make a statement this year and say, you know, we've been at the top of this conference or towards the top, a contender for a, for a while now, for a Yep. years and the last year they want to prove I'd imagine is an aberration so what a better opportunity than going to Army and try and win in week one um, this this time around hey and they were a CAA tournament team last year lost in the semifinals to the eventual champions Drexel and yeah. we saw what they did against Notre Dame so I mean they were right there in the conversation as one of the top teams in the conference and I think they've just been overshadowed but why but what Drexel and Delaware haven't coming back UMass can make some noise here in the non-conference. Look out for them to be a top 20 team in a couple of weeks. Yeah, if you're going to trust anybody, I think Greg Canella with that squad. For sure. And that's the, that's the way to go. All right, let's flip the switch to the women's game now. We're going to go some rapid-fire picks going through and around the country, starting off Travis, Stanford at Syracuse, 4 p.m. Friday. Another another new debut for Syracuse for head coach. Caleb Trainer's first game back at the Carrier Dome. I got Cuse. They can't lose in mm. K-Train's debut, so I got Syracuse over Stanford. Interesting. Though, be careful of Stanford. This Stanford team is really talented. I think they give them a run. I think some of the youth, it's going to take some time here for Stanford to put that influx of youth and enthusiasm to what they already have. In a couple of, like in about a month, I think this is a different game that you're getting here in February. Okay. 
Uh, I think that makes a lot of sense. All right, let's roll with it. Uh, what do you got? I've got Northwestern at Boston College, a top five battle. Maybe the battle of the weekend to the women's game or even By the, the way, entire game. This game's being played indoors in front of no fans. It's supposed to be 50 in Boston this weekend. Can we change this? <laughs> I mean, Hopefully by the time you're listening to this, we can change this. But who I, do you like? Leaning towards Northwestern if Izzy Skane would have been in the lineup. Yep. Unfortunately, she's not going to be there all year long. I think it would have been. It's going to be a great game regardless. We know the talent Northwestern has, but we know the talent that – uh, they possess at Boston College as well. I think someone to watch for North Northwestern. Leah Holmes, part of that U19 gold yep. medal team, now in her second season. I think maybe she's going to have a coming out party going up against her former teammate on that U19 team, Belle Smith. Start talking about Belle Smith because we're going to be at the end of the year. I got BC winning this one. How many is North have? How many, is, how many points does North have against Northwestern and against Madison Doucette? I think it might be a little bit lower scoring. We'll see. I, I, what I put, 15, 13? Now yeah. I'm trying to – maybe that's going to be a little bit lower than I thought. I'll I go know. a six for North, like I, a three and three type thing. I think it's going to be a running gun game that you do? we've okay. seen in the last couple of years. I, I think right. that's high scoring. Anyway, uh, I got UNC JMU, a game you can see right here on Lack Sports Network. Tom's got the call on Saturday. I think these heels have too much talent. I've got North Carolina by more than five, 20 to 14. I, I like JMU. I think North Carolina is coming out trying to make a statement after what happened at the end of last year. I think they got a ton of talent. They've got so much coming back. I, I also think JMU to get to 14 would be really good. It, it's going to be really hard for them to keep pace with the heels offense with everything that GM, or that North Carolina has on the defensive end, too. The draw is going to be really important in terms of the runs of this game. Yeah. And you look at on a full scale, James Madison has a lot coming back they next do. year and a lot of continuity. And I think in the first game of the year, that's really going to matter, especially here. Maybe a little closer than what you said. Okay. I'm not going to make a pick. I, I mean, I hope for your sake it is really close. <laughs> right. would be, I mean, for our sake, it would be great and very entertaining. I don't know. And, I just and, got the heels. And JMU has played Carolina tough. They have. It's consistently through the years. They, uh, Of course, we know, I think it was 15 to 5 in the first game of last year. JMU was going through a lot of COVID stuff back then. That was not the JMU team that finished up the year, gave North Carolina a hard time in the NCAAs. So these have a, a nice little history. This has been a nice rivalry the last few years. Always a great way to start the year. Yeah, absolutely. All right, let's go out to Michigan at Notre Dame. I laugh. This game's <laughs> scheduled for 6 p.m. on Sunday. 6 p.m. Hey, Michigan Notre Dame head to head with the Super Bowl. I, Let's I know go. they're talking lacrosse, but when you hear Michigan and Notre Dame, what do you think of football? You think of football? Yeah, I don't. It doesn't make any sense to me, um, but it is what it is. 6 p.m. on Sunday. If you want to second screen it, by all means, do what you got to do. I like uh, Notre Dame. Michigan is in the top 25. They're 23rd, but they do lose um, from last year. Molly Garrett graduated, and Michigan had a rough year. They all the whole Big Ten schedule thing too. But Molly Garrett has graduated, and she's moved on. I think if she's in this game it's a little bit different but Notre Dame of course they have um, Casey Choma Madison Ahern back again so I like Notre Dame I mean they're a top five team in the country yeah. and had a couple of close losses last year Notre Dame and I think maybe they'll learn from those um, to UNC and Syracuse they're really close almost there and I feel like they're getting closer and closer to getting it over the tip of the iceberg so I like Notre Dame in this one 14 to 7 I have them winning and going away in all seriousness with the speed of the game of the Super Bowl typically you may be able to watch this whole game before halftime and then get to the second half. <laughs> That's true. That's you true. You can man. also second screen it. All right, let's go to a game a little bit more off the radar. William and Mary mm. at Villanova. Obviously, it's Jill Bachelor's first head, uh, game as head coach for the Wildcats. But I'm, but I'm leading toward the tribe in this one. I like right. William and Mary, 11-9. Keep an eye on uh, Belle Martyr spoiling Jill Bachelor's debut. It's going to be really interesting to see her versus Sydney Frank, who's the preseason Big East Defender of the Year for Villanova. That's going to be a fun matchup. Yeah, one of the best scorers in the conference, Bell Matiri, and yeah. um, maybe be making some noise in the rest of the country as the year goes on, as, as she continues to get better. Really, she's fun to watch, really talented. Yeah, she is. She has been since her freshman year. All right, I will move on. Army at number 22, Temple, 1 p.m. on Saturday, the Michelle Tumalo debut for Army. They return a senior attacker in Caroline Raymond, 22 goals, 6 assists. They also won 5 in a row at the end of the regular season last year, Army. So I love when a team ends the season on a good note. I know it means a little bit, but you sort of have that springboard into your entire offseason. So I like Army in this one, despite, of course, Temple being a tournament team last Ooh. year. They do lose, they lose their top two scorers. So yeah. I like Army winning in Michelle Tumalo's debut. Wow, that would be a good win for the Black Knights. Yeah. Good way to start. Uh, let's go down south. Virginia Tech 
at Jacksonville. Okay. I actually think this is a really intriguing matchup. Top 20, Jacksonville. Yeah, the Dolphins coming off the best season in program history. They have just about everything coming back. So I'm going Jacksonville 12 to 10. They've, I think they've got the continuity, and this team knows this is an opportunity against an ACC program to get a marquee win, something they don't get a lot of opportunities at. So I'm going Jacksonville uh, by two over the Hokies. All right, I like that matchup. Mount St. Mary's at Towson, 1 p.m. on Saturday. Mount won the NEC championship last year. They do, though, lose the majority of their attack unit. I'm looking at the draw control. Great matchup. Beanie Colson in a circle against the sophomore Lindsey Marshall at 102 draw controls last year for Towson. But it's the Towson... Uh, CA freshman of the year, Blair Perry, the one I'm going to be watching. She is one of the next up-and-coming scorers in that conference, and I think she scores just enough, and maybe five, six goals from her against this Mount team. So I like it 11-9, to nine, Towson on top. Okay, uh, let's go Louisville at Denver, and I'm going with the team that's the unanimous pick to win the Big East Conference in the Pioneers. I think that's all you need to know. They've got uh, some talent coming back here, and I, the Cardinals – of all the teams in the ACC, they, I think of the teams that have been there, I, obviously we added Pitt into the mix. I think they've got something to prove, but uh, I like the Pios in this one. All right, last one. Stanford heading east down the New York State Thruway to take on Albany. That game at 1 p.m. on Sunday. Albany obviously really good in the America East. They returned their leading scorer, Katie Pascal, from a year ago. But then you got Ali Bayoko for Stanford. All those uh, red-shirted freshmen now turned sophomore, second-year players. 17 or whatever, to 10. Whatever you want to say. I think Stanford wins this going away. They're going to learn a lot from the Syracuse game regardless. And, and I think they're going to make the, this uh, part of the East Coast trip, this New York trip, worth it for them. And show, uh, I think, the rest of the country what they've got after a very ballyhooed offseason for Stanford. They yeah. got the cover of IL Women and Inside Lacrosse and all that. So I think Stanford's going to make a bit of a statement. Maybe against Syracuse. You had that pick. I don't know. But <laughs> they're going to do it against you, Albany. You like them over Syracuse? I think it's going to be closer than okay. you think. I, right. I mean, they got a legitimate chance. I think Syracuse, you know, with that Emma Ward injury coming a little bit later, you know. Yeah, it, it but was, they also they, they have they, to. I know. I'm very. How high. many people did they lose last year? There's a, there was the a, final four. There's a lot of things that changed for Syracuse in the offseason after okay. you know, a lot of continuity yeah. for a lot of years. I have faith in Kayla Trainer, but I mean, sometimes it takes a while to adjust. First game. It's the All first right. game of the year. It is. You're right. I you just, I, I'm still going to Syracuse. Okay. I do think that second game, especially if they lose to Syracuse, that second game against U Albany for Stanford, really big in terms yeah. of national perception and all that. Uh, speaking of a big game, coming up here on Friday on LSN, our first game of the year, we got Hopkins at Towson. Going to be a great game, 6 p.m. Eastern time. And in order to preview that, we're joined by Joey Epstein from Hopkins. So we've got Joey Epstein joining us now. Uh, Joey, you guys got one under your belt last weekend. Uh, we were talking about it before. A win is a win. Hey, what was the feeling entering that first game for you guys as a program, knowing the disappointment that you guys had in a very unique season last year? Um, you know, we were anxious and excited to play. You know, when you build up like this, you know, from fall and winter and preseason, you know, you're anxious to get the first one. Um, and fortunately, we did. I wouldn't say it was the prettiest game, but, you know, a win's a win and messes are going to happen, especially in early February. And you got to fight through it and find a way. And I felt like, you know, last year, we talk about what you, your mindset was going into the first game of this year. But the way you finished last year, you sort of maybe have to throw the record away a bit because you finished strong. And it felt like, you know, with everything going on the year before and, and trying to get acclimated to each other, maybe you finally clicked. Did you feel that, too, heading into the offseason? Like, yeah, we, we were – the record was what it was, but our best lacrosse came at the right time? Yeah. I mean, you don't want to create explanations or excuses. I mean – Four and nine is a disappointment of a season. Um, you know, luckily we have this year um, and we have that kind of end of season to build off of. And we have a lot of returning pieces. Um, and, you know, I believe we put in the work. I believe we built a good culture. Um, but again, it's about it's about producing when it when it matters. So we'll find out if we built off of it. What's been the biggest difference in adjusting to Coach Milliman and his style of coaching? Um, you know, it's, it's similar in a lot of aspects and different, you know, he, he really preaches effort and, you know, focus and the simple things, um, you know, building a culture that you'll fight for everything to get a ground ball, 
or to, you know, make the three pass away hockey assist. Um, I think it's more about um, more about competition than execution. How bad, how badly do you really want to make the play? For you as a leader on the team, obviously, since sophomore year, you've been a captain. What are some of the things you preach? What, what are some of the things you want to see from your teammates uh, that you're able to lead by? Um, I think similarly to Coach Milliman, um, I agree with him on that it's, it's about competition. It's about what you're willing to sacrifice um, for your teammates, for our program to win games. Um, and, you know, sometimes that's what you're doing on a Tuesday um, after or before practice. And then sometimes it's about diving for end lines in game and, you know, making those selfless plays for the team. So uh, everybody's joked about it this offseason, but for me as a Syracuse alum, looking at your former coach, Dave Petromala, and seeing him in orange is really weird still, even though it's, we've had a whole fall and beginning of the season. How weird is it going to be for you when you suit up and you see him in orange on the opposite sideline coming up in about a month? Uh, I mean, <laughs> trying to focus day by day and you know focus on these games, but that burnt orange is probably going to look pretty ugly. <laughs> uh, come home with field come that time so. i mean you're someone who obviously it's been your life i mean hopkins lacrosse since you were a kid you've been going to those games so you you you're uh, within the fa fabric right so you've got to have some feelings i'd imagine yeah i mean there are some mixed emotions definitely um but you know we'll we'll get there when we get there i know a lot of hopkins alumni and fans will show out and that'll be a special game definitely yeah, for sure. Hey, I mean, you talk about it, you, obviously, you wanted to, to be part of this program, and, and now you're in it. Growing up, when you look back at all the Hopkins legends, like, who's your guy? If there was one guy you could pick of all the different great players who've come through that program, like, who's the dude that you looked up to or the guy you wanted to replicate? Who's that guy for you? Uh, I mean, a lot of great players, you know. I think he was a little before me. I was a little too young. Obviously, Kyle Harrison um, is the epitome of Johns Hopkins across. But you have guys like, you know, Benson Irwin, um, who don't get recognized as much, who, you know, sacrifice just as much to be a D-Mitty and make those plays. Um, guys like that. I guess as an attackman, I love Zach Palmer, Chris Boland, Kyle Warden. You know, list goes on. I mean, you talk a lot about the culture of what it is today, but you know some of those legends of the past, they established that. What's it mean to be a part of that tradition? Uh, I mean, it's special, you know, growing up watching Johns Hopkins lacrosse. Um, we talk about it. It's, you know, we refer to it as a long blue line. Um, and, you know, it's special to just be that speck at the end of that line um, and contribute to the past, the future. You, uh, we, we talk about the new coaching staff, and, and you got an offensive coordinator who is a pretty darn good player in his own right, and John Grant Jr. What's been the most unique thing about being around Jr. as much as you are now? Um, I, I would say probably his carefree um, attitude most of the time. You know, we have those moments. Um, but yeah, I think his ability um, to forget a mistake for a player, but also to, you know, critique. Not always the X's and O's, um, but the subtleties that go into being a good player, um, whether it's deception or um, off-ball play, you know, countless little little things that he was able to manipulate to be such a special player. Does he tell stories? Is he like a story guy? Uh, not so much a story guy, but yeah, he, he references plenty of championships and points. <laughs> and he can. <laughs> yeah, in yeah, like he's... every league he's ever played in. <laughs> Yeah, I think we had some trivia night the other night, and I think he had – one of the last questions was on him, and I think he had – it was, you know, total points in his professional career. Most guys guessed, you know, 500, maybe 1,000. You know, it was over 2,100. It was ridiculous. So what – has he done anything in practice where you just, like, had to, like, do, like, a double take when you went, what on earth was that, like, with a stick? Does he still pull anything out? Yeah, he pulls some stuff out. He warms up some of the goalies. He's got, like, no hips, so he's hipless, so he can't really move, and he shoots off of one leg, but, no, nah, he's still able to score the ball, definitely. Well, that's the crazy <laughs> thing, because he probably could go still suit up in the NLL and, like, get two or three goals in a game, and you're right. He, like, the mo mobility is probably to be desired. Yeah, no, I should probably trade my jersey someday and 
sneak them in, sneak them in again. <laughs> you, you, you know, because you, you talk to guys all the time and girls, too, about, you know, making a, a sick, uh, you know, behind the back or through the legs. And, of course, we know Junior does that. And, you know, a lot of times they say, oh, it was in the moment. You know, it was a reactionary thing. Is that something he talks about at all or tries to impart, saying, oh, here's some a time to be creative? You, you know what I mean? Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, he's definitely um, imparted a lot of wisdom on moments when to be creative. Um, I don't know if we're going to go one-handed between the legs ever. Um, but, yeah, there are moments for the behind the back, um, and we work on those. Joey, obviously, when you got to Hopkins, you were highly regarded as a recruit. You had high expectations for yourself in this program. As you look back at what you've done so far, and there have been some bumps in the roads, uh, in the road, how would you describe your career so far at Hopkins and what you want to, to accomplish still? Uh, I mean, when you come to Johns Hopkins, the goal is to win a national championship, um, and those are the expectations. So I really haven't come close to that. I feel like um, as a leader, I think I've been able to help shape um, the culture and what type of guys we want in the locker room. But um, as a player, as a member of this program, yeah, you know, surface hasn't been scratched. You've always been a guy, even before you even came on campus, I remember Coach Petro talking about your work ethic. And that something that you came into college with, sometimes guys learn that over time. You talked about the competitiveness earlier, too. What it, What is your motivation and inspiration to, to get in there and, and do the tough workouts and do the tough things that make things a little bit more difficult and challenging? What What behind that for you is is your motivation? Um, it's to not have a regret. I mean, your why, it, it, I think – Players wise, you know, why you do all that, why you put all that work in. I think it changes. Um, when I was younger, I think I was, you know, very outcome oriented. Um, and as I've gotten older and the results haven't always been there, um, you learn it's about the guys in the locker room, um, you know, doing it for them, becoming um, externally motivated by the guys around you, um, winning for them, not, not for yourself or accolades. Well, uh, Joey, we're excited to see you here on Friday night to kick off our uh, season here on LSN against Towson. We wish you the best of luck uh, this weekend and down the road. We appreciate the time. Thanks, man. Thank you, guys. Have a good one. Thanks, Joey. So Lehigh head coach Kevin Cassis is joining us now. Uh, coach, we appreciate you taking some time. How's it feel to, to get being this close to being back? It uh, feels great. It feels great. I actually feel like we're, uh, we're, we're late. We're late to the party, um, you know, with uh, Mercer and Bellarmine playing last week and uh, a bunch of games slated this week. We, we don't open up uh, till next week. So I feel like we're, we're definitely late to the party, but it is great to be back and uh, feels a little bit more normal uh, than last year. So that's been, that's been nice. And uh, I'm just excited to get, get back into game action. That, that means you got some extra time to prep, right? I mean, as a coach, you got to love that. Oh, it's great. We, we started preseason January 20th. Um, you know, last year we weren't even allowed to, to be on campus till February 1st. And, uh, you know, and, and obviously with with opening up a, a week later than everybody else, a little extra time to prep. And uh, um, that, that was pointed. We're, we're trying to, to be better uh, towards the end of the season, uh, be a little bit fresher, uh, you know, as we hit April and, and get ready, uh, you know, hopefully to, to participate in the Patriot League tournament and uh, just to try and be a bit fresher when we get to that point. Interesting. Uh, you know, we talked a lot. I've talked to Lars Tiffany about this a couple of times. Obviously, they have perfected peaking at the right time the last couple of times around. You, you know what I'm saying? It's interesting that, you know, you mentioned that and that's such a point of emphasis for you guys. It feels like that there is an art to that, right? There is. Um, it, it's it's tough, though, at the beginning, because as a coach, you want to make sure that you're prepared for the first game. And I think what you have to realize is that you're, you're just not going to be able to get to everything. So your schemes might be a, a bit more vanilla um, than, than the teams that you're playing against. And uh, but you just have to have to hope that your 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 preparation in the fall and, and what you did in the preseason will, will help you with that. And um, just make sure the guys are, are ready to play. And I, I do think that, you know, most often uh, the fresher team you know does does have a better chance of winning and um obviously we want to be prepared too so it's definitely a balance but um a little scary as a coach if uh, you're not as prepared for those early games i mean you guys are coming off a season where you you made it back to the ncaa tournament it, that's like you, everybody you walk into the season with goals and, and you guys got there and it had been the first time in a while for this lehigh program that had been in that conversation just you hadn't gotten there so what did that mean for this group especially considering you got a, a whole bunch back from from that group last year 
Yeah, it was huge. I think for, for us to take that step last year and um, especially with a relatively young team um, we have most of those guys back this year. So to gain that experience uh, I think was really important. Now, you know, the experience honestly wasn't great. We, we didn't put our best foot forward and, and, you know, Rutgers got after us and, um, I think that, you know, that, that, that left a, a bitter taste in our mouth. And, uh, you know, so there's been a lot of talk about getting back to that point, which is great. I, I love to talk about trying to get back there, but we have to remember the process that got us to that point last year. And, um, there was a lot of hard work and effort, um, a lot of time spent, you know, day by day, just getting ourselves to a place where we could be successful enough to get there. And, uh, there's been a lot of reminders about what that took and, and, and how we have to try and, and replicate that with, a yeah, it's, it's a lot of, a lot of familiar faces, but still a new group every year is a new team. And, and we have to, to make sure that we, we don't take any of that for granted. Uh, but that is certainly a goal is to get back to that stage again and to perform better than we did last year. It certainly sounds like you probably learned a few lessons uh, in different ways at the end of this, that last stretch of the season, of, of course, with the championship game getting canceled and then the rough go in the NCAA tournament. It sounds like there were some lessons learned there in a lot of different ways. Like you said, not taking things for granted. Yeah, a hundred percent. I just think that, uh, you know, it's, it's it, any time that, that you go through an experience, um, you know, you, you learn from it. And uh, that was in a lot of ways that, that was, last year was was all about that. Um, new things uh, all, all over the place, you know, COVID protocols, that this, that and the other thing. Um, and uh, you learn a lot about yourselves. You learn a lot about your team, a lot about your your ability to lead through times like that. And um, and then that, that helps you to, to, to set the frame for the next year. So, uh, yeah, tons of lessons learned, um, a, a lot of, a lot of conversations had, um, based off of the success that we had throughout the year. And, and it, it, we, we, listen, we, we did a great job in the Patriot league and went undefeated through all of our Patriot league games that we were afforded the opportunity to play. Um, and we learned a ton about ourselves and about our opponents through all that. And, you know, now we fast forward to this year and a lot of familiar faces in the Patriot league. Um, so we feel like we have that, um, kind of in the bank, but now, now we have to have a little bit of a different feel because I think the tables have turned, um, you know, we, we have a target on our back. I think we were used to putting that target on other people's backs. And, um, so I think that, that, that role, you know, carries some weight with it and, uh, some responsibility. So we have to have a little bit of a different approach this year. And, and I think that's the way that we're approaching it. With uh, you obviously have some, some key guys coming back that we've mentioned, but uh, the attentions of Michael Sisselberger guy, just tore apart the record book last year at the face-off position. He's a first-team preseason All-American. And we see the weight room stuff. Like, describe what it's like in that weight room there at Lehigh when he goes to put up that kind of weight. Yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, there's a lot of eyeballs on that. Uh, we call it the big boy rack. Uh, it's the first rack as you enter the room. And um, anytime it's a, it's a squat day, it's a bench day, you know, you know number 99 is going to be in that big boy rack. And... Uh, so a lot of eyeballs you know, on, on our, our team, but also the other athletes that are in there. And uh, he's he's just a specimen and um, he's worked really hard to get to that point. And, you know, he's uh, he realizes that uh, the, the translation that it has, the, the success that you can have in the weight room, um, all of the work that you put in and 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 what that could mean um, translating over to the lacrosse field. And um, he's also somebody that has joined the the wrestling roster he trained with the wrestling team throughout the course of the winter um and you know if you know anything about wrestling uh, we do that pretty well here at lehigh so um he's he's with incredible athletes training there and you know his, his intention is to to try and be on that roster full-time next year uh, when he comes back for a fifth year so um he's finding any way possible to you know create edge for himself and i think that speaks a lot to his character um, and what makes him so great is that he's always trying to find ways to uh, to push the envelope. He's trying to find ways to challenge himself, and that would just be one one example of that. How I mean, does, uh, yeah, I was going to say. I mean, you're a pretty big guy, like <laughs> athlete wise, and you've you've played against some of the, with and against some of the the great athletes in the sport uh, here in lacrosse in your playing career, like. Athlete wise, describe him like as a person, like, it, can you compare him to anybody? Um, yeah, he's, he's kind of in a class of his own. I, I tried to, I tried to compare him to, uh, to Trevor Baptiste last year. And, uh, and I think that's a pretty, a pretty decent, um, comparison, but, um, I know some of, some of his, 
Rodgers uh, kind of scoffed at that because he's just kind of a unique weapon of his own. Um, so I, I think I think it's tough to, to compare. Um, he's been he's just been kind of extraordinary. Um, I think the the fact that you know he can combine all of the athletic traits that you need to be successful um, and, and the face off position is so unique. It's so different. Um, it's it's not just about you know sheer strength and, and explosion and, and all that. It's it's about the skill and, and the finesse that you need to do it too. And um, he's kind of the, the the perfect combination of all that. Um, but you know, really, what what drives him is is just the motivation to be to be the best. And um, in his mind, it's it's not even about being the best on that day, the best in that season, the the best. Uh, currently in Division One lacrosse, it's about being the best ever. That's what he wants to be, and he's trying to find any which way that he can challenge himself to do that. So uh, comparisons are tough um, when we talk about that type of a mindset. Um, so um, I think he's in that way. He's kind of in a class of his own. How does that impact everybody around him? Makes him better. Um, you know, that's it's he's he's out there uh, setting a high standard. Um, you know, pushing the envelope and training and. Um, attention to detail and, and watching film and um, that that rubs off that kind of bleeds through to, to everybody else and uh, they realize how successful that he's been and um, it's not it's it's not any secret potion it's just you know hard work and and dedication uh, to, to the craft and the trade and um, without a doubt that that elevates those around him and it's turned him into a, a fantastic leader for our program. We were uh, talking to Nick Myers a couple of weeks ago, and obviously he has the chance to coach uh, one of your players, Cole Kirst, on that now U21 Team USA team. And he couldn't say more good things about Cole as a person and a leader and a player. What's it like for you to have him kind of full time uh, on this Lehigh team? Yeah, he, Cole is just electric. Um, his, his personality, his uh the, the, the energy that he brings to the team, um, obviously as a team captain, um, you know, and a unanimous uh, selection for team captain, um, he, he just, he just kind of electrifies the group. Um, you know, he's, he's such a, a positive influence on his teammates. Um, he's maybe the, the, one of the best teammates that I've ever been around as a player or a coach. Um, just the sheer, the sheer joy that, that he would display is when his teammates make a great play, um, when they make a, a small, you know, small, even if it's small play decision, whatever it is, um, he's the, the first one there to celebrate with them and for them. And um, I just think that that that's really what you get with him. He's obviously a tremendous player, tremendous talent, but um, what, what he brings um, from a, an intangible standpoint is something that's tough to replicate. He's, you mentioned he's one of the captains. He's one of five you have this year. I've always found it interesting in a team dynamic that the, the amount of captains and how that impacts things and changes from year to year. From your perspective, I guess, in terms of the leadership on a, in a team, in a group, how, do, how does that change and why five might be different than two or three? Yeah, I think every team is different. Uh, every year is different. Um, I've, I've had teams that have had a sole captain. Um, I've had teams that have had, you know, uh, not, not really more than five. Five's kind of been our max. Um, although I think one year we had six. We had uh, um, a couple of, of our main captains and, and then we had a few assistant captains. So I think there's a lot of ways to go about it. And I think it just depends on what that team needs in that specific year. Um, and, and what the leadership dynamic on the team is. And uh, we have a larger roster uh, now. I think most teams do across the country. So uh, a couple of fifth years that have come back. And, um, you know, so for us, uh, Teddy Leggett and James Spencer are fifth years and they're both captains and deservedly so. And you also have this group that you've been cultivating for several years that are true seniors and guys that are led, ready to, to lead in, in their own way. Um, so, you know, you kind of can create this, this super team of leadership with um, a group of guys that have kind of been there and done that and a group of guys that are emerging to, to take on those leadership roles. So I think for us, that just made sense for this year. And I think every team's different and every year is different, but that's, that's the way that we decided to go this year. And it's been great for our team. Uh, you obviously have a, a terrific staff there, and uh, you've added in some, some nice pieces here over the last couple of years. But I, I think it's so interesting that, Really, one of your main constants has been your dad as part of the the quality control person on your staff. What does it mean? <laughs> what does it mean to have your dad, who obviously was a, a terrific coach in his own right in a, in a different sport throughout his career? But how cool is it to have your dad in the mix there as part of this program that you've helped develop? 
Yeah. You know, you know, what's been really cool about it. And um, I, I've learned this over the years is that, you know, when you're the head coach or, or maybe when you're the CEO, it, you don't really get a lot of feedback. Um, you know, it's no, no one, no one's coming to you and telling you you're doing a bad job. Um, honestly, no one really tells you if you're doing a good job. Um, you just don't get, you don't get any feedback. And, you know, so when I have my dad around, he's not afraid to tell me how it is. If, I, if, if he doesn't think I'm doing well, or if he thinks I need to change something, or even if I am doing well, he'll, he'll tell me. And um, so sometimes I just appreciate getting honest feedback and my dad's never going to be afraid to give me that. Do you ever tell him what he's doing well or not well? <laughs> yeah, definitely. We've had that exchange and uh, I played for him. So he was my high school football coach and I was his quarterback. So, um, you know, I got a few stern talkings to, uh, and when I, I spoke back or when the play wasn't called in quickly enough or whatever that was. And now uh, the tables have turned so I can, I can get after him a little bit and get some payback for all those times he really got after me on the football field. I was going to say, was there ever a time when like high school, you could have ever imagined hiring your dad as part of staff? Yeah, I, I'm not, I'm not so sure. Uh, I, you know, I, I don't think, I don't think that crossed my mind, but um, it really worked out well. Uh, when, when I got the job here at Lehigh, he was retiring from his high school football job and, and his, uh, his phys ed teaching job. And, um, kind of looked at each other and said, well, what are you going to do now? And, uh, you know, I, I got the job here and I said, well, we could really use some help. And he just jumped on and it's been, it's been a lot of fun to have him. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. It is really cool. I, Kevin, you've been now at Lehigh for a while and you've really, I've been able to, I feel like, establish this program as, as your own. What has it been about Lehigh and about what you've established that, that keeps you around and keeps you tied to this, this program and, and what keeps you there with the Mountain Hawks? Uh, de definitely the people. Um, the, the people at Lehigh are, are tremendous people. Um, my, my administrators have been great. Um, our alumni base has been great. Um, there's been a growth mindset uh, ever since I got the job here of, of helping to to take this program to the elite level of the division one lacrosse world. And, you know, with the understanding that that wasn't necessarily going to happen overnight. Um, so it's been a stepwise process. It's been a lot of fun. Um, I've learned a ton. Um, I got the job here. I was, I was 26 years old. The oldest player was, was 23. Uh, in a fifth year, I was 23. So um, it was like coaching a younger brother. And, um, so I've learned a ton. I've changed a lot over the years, uh, been able to kind of hone in on what makes me, um, you know, successful as a coach, as a leader and, and what doesn't. Um, and I've had people that have been able to, to, to help me along the way, but um, also the, the coaching staff and the consistency of, of, of my coaching staff has been great. A lot of guys that have played for me are now coming back to coach for me. Uh, currently, you know, Will Scudder is my associate head coach and uh, David DiMaria um, is now back on staff and you know, one of our, our top players here of all time. So uh, it's been a lot of fun to, to see that, but I definitely think, uh, you know, the people and obviously the, the players, um, you know, we get great kids, uh, kids that really want to be successful on and off the field, um, that, that love one another, um, really buy into what our culture is all about. But um, that, that's been it's just been a lot of fun, um, but also that, that commitment to, to growing um, and, and becoming better every single year has made it uh, um, just an honor to, to be here now for, for 15 years. What is the next step, I guess, in, in the, on the horizon for you in this program and, and the next goal? Yeah, so I think the next immediate goal is to have a really good practice today. <laughs> that was, that's, that's, I knew that's, it. I knew that. I knew that was coming. I got to work in some coach speak. You know, uh, that's, that's how it walked works. right into it, man. I know, I know. But that that is that is you know what I'm I'm preaching to my guys and have a great practice today and um, you know really enjoy the process of of, of you know the, the season um, and and being able to to have somewhat of a, a more normal season and play a few more games than we did last year and, and hopefully put ourselves in position to compete for a Patriot league uh, tournament berth and, and, you know, Patriot league championship and, and all that and, and allow us to get to that next stage of getting back to the NCAA tournament. Uh, the one thing that we haven't done um, as a program is we, we haven't won an NCAA tournament game. Um, that's something that we've talked about a lot and um, getting to that stage is one thing. And we got to make sure that, that we do everything in our power to get back there and then, you know, hopefully taking the next step and, you know, truly competing for a national championship is, is really been the vision here from day one when I, I was 26 years old. 
Um, and that's something that I truly believe in that I, I know we can do. And, and that would be the next step in that process. But I mean, we can't put the cart before the horse. We got to focus on today and, and the first game and, and all that. Hey, uh, one more for you before we let you go. Obviously, the name, image, and likeness stuff is is huge, and it's changing college sports, and I, we still, I don't think, know how it's going to continue to change things over the next handful of years. But I think you have a unique perspective because you obviously were an elite player uh, coming up through college and, and went to an elite program, and now you're coaching elite players who are all-American guys who, I mean, at some point, like, brands are – going to want to stamp their approval on and, and be able to, to give something and, and grow their brands with, with guys on your team. How do you foresee the landscape playing out here over the next couple of years, at least in the short term with name, image, and likeness? Yeah, I think, I think it's an interesting opportunity. Um, it's, it's one that I think honestly is, is good for the kids to be able to explore. Um, I'm really interested to see how that, uh, how, how that kind of, uh, resonates with lacrosse and, and, you know, what that means for lacrosse. Um, you know, I, I have, I have seen it, you know, firsthand just with Mikey Sisselberger. Um, you know, there's, he's drawn a lot of attention, um, for, you know, here in the local market. I mean, it's, it's a dream come true. I mean, it's Lehigh Valley product, um, you know, and, and kind of a hometown hero. So, uh, there's been a lot of interest locally, um, certainly around that. Um, the, the one thing that has been really interesting to see is that, there, there isn't a lot of guidance uh, for the kids just yet. Um, and that's one thing that I have concern for. And um, a lot of times, you know, they're you know, may, maybe at some schools and, you know, for some of the more high, hope higher uh, pro, uh, profile sports, they're, they're, they have a team of people um, that are working to help these kids to, to, to maneuver and, and, and figure out how to, how to manage the process and, you know, make sure that they don't actually get taken advantage of. Because I, I do think that could be a, a really negative byproduct of this thing. I think the opportunity is tremendous for these kids, but um, I do think that they could be taken advantage of as well. So um, I think that that's, that's kind of where my head's at is, all right, you know, this, this could be a really good opportunity, good things, uh, good thing for these kids, but um, hopefully they're, they're able to, to figure that out. And if there's a way, they really try and keep the coaches out of it. Um, but in a lot of ways, I feel like we might be the, the best ones to help them to, to figure out if they are getting taken advantage of or what the best opportunity might be. So um, I feel like that's the next step is trying to figure out how to get some uh, appropriate representation for these kids to be able to figure out how to how to manage and how to figure it out. And like you said, that might fall on you, right? At the end of the day, is that just something else for right. you to, to dip your head in? Yeah, yeah, correct. And, uh, you know, as, as much as I can, because you know, I think there's uh, – there are some restrictions um, that that we're not we're not allowed to you know to be the ones brokering deals and doing all that and and I get all that I understand that but um, at the end of the day our, our jobs as coaches is to to to, to help develop these kids and, and in some ways protect these kids and um, I don't I don't take that responsibility lightly for sure well uh, Kevin we can't wait to see you guys back on the field and uh, good luck as you get ready we'll uh, we'll talk again soon all right I appreciate it thank you guys for having me. Cool. Right. Thanks. Thanks, Kevin. Great hearing from Kevin Cassis. Yeah. As always, looking forward to seeing Lehigh, I think, this year. They're going to be fun. And kind they of are going to be fun. Dangerous, right? It's Very dangerous. Are, you don't want to play, especially when it comes to tournament time. Yeah, especially with, not with Michael Sisselberg. Oh, yeah. <laughs> the face first, first guy getting off the bus, I'm like, sure you're there. Yeah, that's, it's <laughs> like you're like, whoa, where, yeah. where did this team come from? They got NGIT mm. to kick off the season here this weekend. The Mountain Hawks do. All right. Uh, games that we are watching. If there is one game in the college game that you are watching this weekend, what is it, Tom? Well, just rewind and I'll, my explanation. I'm watching Stanford at Syracuse Women. So uh, we just talked about that before the interview. Yep. If you missed it, just rewind. I'll tell you why. But I'll just repeat it. It's going to be a really fun matchup, I think. Stanford trying to prove a point and tell people that they and show people that they belong. Yeah. Syracuse, the debut of Kayla Trainer, Emily Harrishuk returning as well. Um, and, and of course, Syracuse coming off a great season last year as well so that's gonna be a, I think the matchup's gonna be great it's gonna be in, in the dome yep. and, and everything like that it's, it's gonna be a lot of fun so you're not gonna watch our game my game we game will we will be watching a couple of games okay you got once. multiple screens going yeah okay that's because, what it's all about uh, that's, because that's my the, games the, I've got time in the world games I'm watching this weekend including the game I'm doing here on Friday 
Hopkins, you Towson. You can't have it be the game you're doing. I can because, I, first of all, I have to watch it. I'm doing it. Second of all, I'm really intrigued to see this weekend for Hopkins because not mm. only do they play Towson on Friday, but then they go to Georgetown on Sunday. So the combination of oh, these things I see. Okay. for Johns Hopkins are huge. I mean, this we were talking about this schedule in the, the newsroom earlier today. I mean, Hopkins' schedule is Loaded. Toughest in the country. Oh, but, I mean, maybe by far. I Toughest mean, their the their schedule is ridiculous. They and that game against Towson's huge because you get then a top five opponent in uh, in uh, Georgetown coming up later in the weekend. They've got what Virginia on the schedule. Yeah. Loyola. Yeah, obviously, the Big Ten slate is loaded. This team is going to be battle tested. So this is a huge weekend. I think after what Joey Epstein, you heard him say. Maybe it was kind of a slow start against Jacksonville, not the cleanest game that they were looking for. I think this weekend's going to tell us a lot about Johns Hopkins yeah. and what they're going to be bit, this year. Bit of a chip on their shoulder. You can yeah. feel that. that They, they want to prove something. And I think Joey Epstein, after the last couple of years and wanting to cement his legacy, I think that's big. And these games for them are going to be big. So. For sure. Um, going to NLL game to watch? Yeah. Um, what I'm, are you watching? I'm going north of the border. Okay. Because I the Buffalo-Toronto rivalry is always awesome. Mm, yeah, I was looking this at that game, This one yeah. up in Canada, Hamilton, just outside Toronto, new home for the Rock. Rock Bandits. Bandits have looked like the best team in the NLL. They're 6-0. I think they are. I, I think <laughs> they, they are, the too. I think we're going to do power rankings coming up next week, so stay tuned for those. But, I'm, but Toronto always plays them tough. No matter what the records are, the season, no matter what, Toronto's always difficult in Toronto. Keep an eye on that game. I'm intrigued. The Tom Schreiber, now that he's back and healthy, playing really good lacrosse. Um, New dad? Yeah, he's got a lot going on. He so, does, But yeah. he's played really well for them. And The Rock, I feel like, maybe have a little bit of, of that feeling that you, you have this team coming in to your house and let's show them who's boss and they're four and three big opportunity yeah. for the rock to gain some momentum here they're right there in the middle of the pack in the east not where you want to be you want to try no. to distance yourself yeah. give yourself some room for error i got philly going to halifax i, I love this game really too. yeah um philly's kind of been up and down it feels like philly this is the way they've been since they reemerged. of course as a franchise in the NFL. it feels like every game they play is a one goal overtime game no matter who they're playing. <laughs> it doesn't matter who they're playing. So I'm going to watch them play. They're, uh, there's a very entertaining random lacrosse, whether they win or lose. So playing a team in Halifax that's 4-1, and one, have had some COVID things go on. And of they course, with, their, play at with home. their home games. So I'm um, looking forward to seeing how that all shakes out. But uh, it's going to be uh, a good matchup regardless. So I'll, I'll watch that for you sure. You know what? Philly's just pumped up that they finally got rid of James Har or uh, Ben Simmons. Yes. They got James yeah, Harden coming that's right, in. So that, yeah. that's going to propel the wings to victory wow. over a very talented Halifax team. Wow. Mark it down here. Um, yeah, wings. for sure. Well, that, On the road. That's enough of today's show. But the good news is, is that we're going to come at you twice yes, next week. Yes, starting next week. Starting next week, you can hear us and watch us and listen to us, whatever way you consume this program twice in, in one week. Tuesday, Thursday, is that what we're doing? Tuesday and Thursday, new episodes throughout the college lacrosse season, so make sure you uh, subscribe to whether YouTube, uh, wherever you listen to your podcast, or just Swipe keep up. checking the social media twice every week throughout the college season lacrosse now. Going to be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for joining us here today. Enjoy the lacrosse this weekend, and we will recap everything on Tuesday. For Travis, I'm Tom. See you next time. See ya.